thank you all for joining us. Please welcome our moderator, Pulitzer Prize winning author of The Apprentice, Greg Miller, to ask our panel, is Russian collusion a delusion? Greg? Thanks everybody, can you hear me okay? I want to take just a quick minute to, to do a, a little more detailed introduction of our panelists here. Um, uh, Malcolm, I'll start on the very end. Malcolm Nance is a counterterrorism and intelligence consultant for the U.S. government special operations, homeland security, and intelligence agencies. He's also a counterterrorism analyst for NBC News and MSNBC. Uh, he assisted in the investigation of the World Trade Center attacks, trained and advised numerous international government agency personnel on um, in terrorist attacks and countering extremist ideology, including U.S. De uh, Department of Defense and Department of Homeland Security. So if we get in any trouble here on the stage, Malcolm, you are in charge, all right? Okay. <laughs> Next is Vince Houghton, who is the historian and curator of the International Spy Museum. He has a PhD in diplomatic and military history from the fine institution, the University of Maryland, where my oldest daughter is a student now. His research centered on U.S. scientific and technological intelligence, including nuclear intelligence in the Second World War and early Cold War. Then we have Jack Bryan. Jack is an award-winning filmmaker based in New York. While still in college, Jack completed his first documentary feature, Life After Dark, with Anthony Bourdain and chronicles the life and death of New York's most notorious dive bar. His latest film, Active Measures, explores the interconnected rise of Donald Trump and Vladimir Putin and features interviews with subjects including Hillary Clinton, Senator McCain, and Michael McFaul. It made its world premiere in 2018. Virginia Heffernan is a columnist, radio host, critic, and author, most recently of Magic and Loss, The Internet as Art. She writes a weekly opinion column for the LA Times and a monthly culture column for Wired. She also serves as host of Slate's Trumpcast. In 2002, she received a PhD in English and American Literature from Harvard. And finally, Bill Crystal is founder and editor at large of the Weekly Standard. He appears frequently as the, as the leading political commentary shows. Before starting the Weekly Standard in 1995, Mr. Crystal led the Project for the Republican Future, where he helped shape the strategy that produced the 1994 Republican congressional victory. Before that, Mr. Crystal served in senior positions in the Reagan and Bush administrations and taught at the University of Pennsylvania and at Harvard. So thank you, panelists, for being here. Before we get to our first question, I, I wanted to just sort of discuss what happened yesterday. Um, the Justice Department yesterday revealed charges against a Russian national, a woman accused of being the financial manager of a Kremlin-backed operation that, in its own words, sought to wage information warfare against the United States. The Director of National Intelligence in Washington just yesterday released a new statement saying we are concerned about ongoing campaigns by Russia, China, and other foreign actors to undermine confidence in democratic institutions and influence public sentiment and government policies. These activities also may seek to influence voter perceptions and decision making in 2018 and 2020. A new indictment, a statement of warning, a grave warning from the Director of National Intelligence. The interference in 2016 didn't end. It's still happening. We're facing it now. These are government officials who are very worried about it. We're in California. There was even a reference to California in this indictment yesterday. Uh, we talked about the, the sort of talking points that the Kremlin troll factory was given in terms of trying to sow division in California races. Uh, one of the lines was, um, for these trolls in St. Petersburg to try to um, raise questions about um, the number of registered voters in various precincts and counties. And with the message saying, all illegal voters must be kept away from the ballot boxes at distances, quote, beyond artillery firing range. This is a message Russia wanted to, sp to spread across our social media platforms for this race right now in this state. Um, and yet, you know, we're, here we are in a panel where we're talking about the 
collusion delusion, I want to start by asking our panelists, and start with you, Virginia, if you don't mind, why is delusion in the title for this panel? Who is deluded? <laughs> Uh, well, I, I question both words in it. I mean, we've just had enough of calling this collusion. Um, there are two brilliant pieces of um, investigative reporting, very enterprising, by a journalist named Robert Mueller. Um, one is the February indictment of the IRA gang, and the other is the more recent indictment of the military intelligence grew. They're both signed exclusively by Robert Mueller, and they name the charge, which is conspiracy to defraud the United States. We're talking about a fraud charge. So this isn't, was there a handshake? Did people, did, you know, did they or didn't they actually uh, sit in a, Russians and Putin and Trump or whoever, sit in a room and say one thing or another to each other? It's a very specific charge. So I would, I would also question collusion. And delusion, I just don't want to give any time to it. I mean, sowing doubt about actual indictments from our Department of Justice, it's like you question a birth certificate. Um, he, I mean, these are, the, these are empirical documents. They're, you know, indictments that, but to any, uh, anyone who's ever worked in Justice Department knows that these are brilliantly detailed, meticulous indictments, and you have nothing else to read on the subject but the output, the court documents that come from that office. And, you know, Malcolm isn't maybe an exception, but the rest of us are guessing what that exact work is going to be. There have been wonderful, um, you know, exposés by journalists, and my fellow journalists have done a brilliant job. We have people on Trumpcast all the time doing, who've worked with Mueller, worked with James Comey, who've speculated about it all, that's very useful, but we won't, we, you don't get the real story until you read the indictments. To call it a delusion is part of disinformation, frankly, and, um, and suggests, you know, the president's favorite phrase, no collusion. Um, and, um, and honestly, you know, I was so glad Greg mentioned the recent indictments because, it, you know, this is ongoing. Just to give an example from the recent indictments, one of the, um, phrases that was released into Twitter um, was, uh, you know, something Islamophobic, and it was retweeted by none other than Ann Coulter, who's with us this weekend. Um, and, uh, and then just, okay, but just to be fair, <laughs> another one that, you know, had some sort of radical charge about rape and so forth, was retweeted by Rose McGowan. So we're all susceptible to this, and some signs of the you know, infection that is disinformation and the kind of, you know, Iago in Shakespeare and Othello, like mm -hmm. always telling you, your, you know, your wife is sleeping with someone else, your wife is sleeping with someone else, or like, the liberals are a mob, the liberals are a mob, to get you insane. And some of the panels, you know, some of the panels even here seem to reflect a commitment to, you know, the idea that there's like, some cogent position by neo-Nazis, some of whom are here, um, and that we need to take it seriously is a byproduct of that kind of disinformation. And I think the name, the word delusion partakes of that. I've got a, yeah. I've got specific questions for each of you, but is there anybody else who wants to try to, uh, to take a stab at this one? Uh, Vince, it looks like you might have a thought or two. No, I mean, this is, this is, is this on? This is a, a kind of a, the big picture question, right? The idea of who are we going to believe in? And there's a great panel tomorrow called the Deep State that I think that is, is really kind of going to these issues and these ideas of the things that we always grew up. I don't care if you're Republican or Democrat. You trusted certain elements within our government. And in some cases, it was the FBI, right? Now, Hoover was, went way over to the top, the beating up minorities and people he didn't like. But the FBI was the FBI. In the CIA, sure, the Latin American dictatorship here or there, we overthrew somebody we shouldn't have. <laughs> but intelligence, especially given to policymakers, was supposed to be beyond politics. And now we're at a point where we're questioning kind of basic truth. And that just seems like we can't even take that next step to have a conversation about important stuff. If we can't even agree on it, it's like when Bill Clinton argued about what the definition of the word is, is. Right? We can't even have basic conversations. We can't talk about collusion or delusion or any of these things because we don't even have the foundation for having some of the basic conversations that need to happen before we get to those later on. And that's why I'm, I'm somewhat in the same idea of how do we have this collusion argument when we can't even agree on some really, really core issues? Let's go home. Right. <laughs> yeah, here. Let's all go. 
Let me turn um, to you, Bill. So without, uh, hopefully this isn't too naked a plug for my book, but I mean, we, we talked in your background about your role in helping to shape the Republican Party, helping um, uh, working for two different administrations. Um, and I want to ask a question that sort of gets at where that party is now and, and how you explain it or sort of diagnose it. One of the scenes in the book that has really jumped out and gotten more attention than I expected it would is a confrontation in the um, middle of the 2016 race between CIA Director John Brennan and the Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell. Brennan is going to the Hill. He's bringing classified files with him to show them what Russia's doing. Oh my God, we've never seen anything like this before. We got to do something about it. Uh, and McConnell stuns him. Rather than saying, you're right, what the hell is going on here? McConnell says, you're trying to screw our nominee. And not only am I going to refuse to condemn Vladimir Putin or accuse the Kremlin of, Russian, of uh, interference in the election, I will accuse the Obama administration of interference in the election if you guys do what you're saying you're going to do. How did we get here? Uh, that's a good question, and you should ask Mitch McConnell, since the rest of us didn't know about that at the time. I mean, Brennan was a pretty political, I would say, agency director, and had previously been involved in politics to a degree most agency directors hadn't been, and there was suspicion of him on the Hill among Republicans, but that doesn't excuse what McConnell said. It doesn't excuse the Obama administration for not doing anything anyway. At the end of the day, Mitch McConnell had zero power over any of this, and he could have criticized him. And the New York Times, incidentally, didn't they publish a famous article in mid-October, you know, uh, intelligence agencies no find no, no clear links? So yeah, I don't know. It seems trauma. like people were, people did have trouble processing, I think, the degree and purposefulness of the Russian interference mm -hmm. and, and the Russian conspiracy to meddle in our election, whether how much different Americans uh, colluded, if I can use that word, or were involved in a conspiracy. Obviously, I, we hope uh, the special counsel will, will, has discovered maybe, and will let the rest of us know. And then Congress will, will or won't, or there'll be indictments, but of course, in terms of the president, Congress will or won't have to act. In terms of the Republican Party, no, look, I think the party was pretty anti-Putin. I mean, certainly the pressure within Congress was for a more hawkish stance against Putin. The party was pretty favorable to the intelligence agencies. Then Trump was the nominee, and you saw the beginning of a process, and I don't want to blame everything on Trump, he's partly a symptom, but I think he's a symptom who also becomes a cause, and a pretty big cause. And once Trump's the nominee, and Trump is of course more pro-Putin, let's just say, uh, then the whole party begins to adjust, and we've seen that adjustment over the last two years in a way that's very distressing to me, and I think somewhat surprising to me the degree to which, I mean, presidents are powerful, they shape parties that they're, uh, when they're presidents, still the degree of accommodation is really shocking. Um, so I'm not, you know, I think it's very, I mean, the McConnell, it, it, to the degree the McConnell made a difference, I guess we don't really know that, I don't think, in terms of the internal deliberations of the Good. Obama administration, that was very unfortunate. Yeah, I think you're right. I mean, it's fair to say that Obama was looking for a, a bipartisan um, statement um, from, he, he needed cooperation from Republicans. <laughs> he really didn't. He could, have, he could have said more on his own, and I think Hillary Clinton um, uh, deeply resents the fact that he didn't. Right. So I think that's fair criticism. Um, I just wonder sort of if we are, um, was, it, was it always this way or did, did we have some um, misapprehension about the, the extent to which sort of partisan impulses no. would surface and, um, and overwhelm in moments of a real security threat like So the parties have become more partisan and the country's become more divided on partisan grounds and more polarized, obviously, over the last 20 years. But I would say, to be fair, and I plenty to be critical of the Republican Party pre-Trump on, the Republican Party supported Obama, President Obama on various foreign policy issues, some of them much more than the Democrats, on Afghanistan, on actual intelligence issues, which was the party that voted for the NSA uh, kind of policies that the Obama administration wanted that it could not bring a majority of Democrats along with the Republicans. The Republicans, you know, were, they were more hawkish. So when the Obama administration went in a, let's just call it to oversimplify, a slightly more hawkish direction, the Republicans were there. And of course on trade, as late as 2015, for all the partisanship there, the Republicans gave President Obama the, we used to call it the fast track authority, but whatever it is, the authority to negotiate the trade deals when he couldn't get a majority of Democrats who've always been suspicious of that. 
So I am, I've got to say, I, I don't, you know, there was a lot of partisanship. It didn't stop at the water's edge. Obviously, Benghazi, there was a lot going on yeah. that caused resentments and uh, some of it just, some of it unjust. And maybe Republicans are more to blame. I'll even accept that. But I am, I do think Trump was the key change. I mean, I, I believe if Marco Rubio or Jeb Bush or Scott Walker, whoever you want, were the Republican nominee, he would have, there would have been a joint statement by that nominee and Hillary Clinton denouncing Russian interference. They would have told Mitch McConnell and Paul Ryan, you know, we should all cooperate together. It would have been a very different thing. So uh, Trump is a big, Trump was a big problem as a nominee. He's a bigger problem as president. Mm. Malcolm, can I turn to you for a second? Sure. So I want to tap your, this is a panel on Russia, but I want to tap your expertise on Middle East for a second sure. if I can. So Saudi Arabia last night fired five top officials and arrested 18 others, saying that one of my colleagues at the Washington Post, Jamal Khashoggi, was killed in a fist fight at the consulate in Turkey. Um, this happened after the Secretary of State, um, Mike Pompeo, went to Riyadh, and after Trump said that he wondered about rogue killers, and then uh, later this past week celebrated the beating of an American journalist in Montana. What do these developments in Saudi Arabia tell us about how the rest of the world is reacting to this particular era in American leadership? Oh. Well, you know, I just came back from the rest of the world. I just spent two weeks in London and Paris and uh, giving speeches and, and helping uh, get out the vote over there. And one image of us is universal, and this will come all the way back around to Russia. Uh, and because the President of the United States right now, Donald Trump, has decided that America will no longer be what America has been for 243 years, and definitely everything since the end of World War II, uh, he wants to dismantle it. That's the Atlantic Alliance, our principal agreements, trade agreements. Uh, so Riyadh had been watching this with the rise of their new young, you know, their new young crown prince. Mohammed bin Salman, and for the first time in American history, and, and, and I just lived, I lived there for seven years, not in Saudi Arabia, but in the United Arab Emirates, just prior to coming back to you know, the States a few years ago, um, they saw a president of the United States who could be bought. And prior to that, no president of the United States could truly, individually be purchased by them. Barack Obama couldn't be purchased, George W. Bush, they had interest, but their interests were American interests. Donald Trump changed that dynamic. They saw that he was, he was a lux luxury businessman. They, they master luxury over there. Everything's luxurious, right? Um, so they saw that this guy would work for his own interest, his family's interest, and the United States' dignity and honor and human rights could be purchased, and that is exactly what he told them when he went to Riyadh, uh, you know, last year. He said the United States will no longer be considering human rights and other factors in your own nation as a reason to do business with you, which is another way of saying we're going to throw out all of the American experiment and our foreign policy as it's existed since, since you know, the Barbary Wars. Uh, and we are no longer going to live by American values. And the Saudis love that. And that emboldened them and Trump's attacks and Jared Kushner's secret communications and helped Prince Mohammed bin Salman purge his government using U.S. intelligence, right? Jared Kushner went there with U.S. intelligence. 48 hours later, every rich prince above Mohammed bin Salman had been arrested. Uh, including one of the richest men in the world, right? Uh, so this use of that information is a power politics dynamic that could not be bought before. And once that was done, combined with his attacks on the press, they saw America going in a completely different direction, which is true the way that they have always wanted to see America go. A nation that could be like their subcontractors, and I worked over there as a subcontractor, you could be bought, paid for, and told what to do. And now they've done it. And they felt emboldened to get a U.S. resident from Virginia, who is a Saudi citizen, to actually send an assassination team 
to abduct him and murder him, and they're surprised that we're getting upset. But they're just waiting for Donald Trump to cut the deal. And there is a deal that is being cut because Trump has already essentially said, we have their excuse good enough for me. And I call this now the full Kavanaugh, right? Where you can just lie, and then that lie is now acceptable, and I'll call it a, a sufficient investigation. So, now, well, Malcolm, what does that have to do with Russia? Well, you know, I wrote two books on, on, on this. As a matter of fact, I will be so bold as to say, I am the first person in the United States in media on July 25th, 2016. I went on television. MSNBC had no idea what I was going to say. And I said, the United States is under attack in a wide-ranging, deep cyber warfare and information warfare operation aimed at splitting the Democratic Party in half and electing Donald Trump president. And then I wrote another book of my first book that came out five weeks before the election, The Plot to Hack America. We are under attack. There is no delusion. The only delusion are those people who no longer care about America's values. And anyone who says, oh, well, you know, this is just the way it was, you know, ad adheres to Donald Trump's belief, you, these people literally are throwing out everything they believed before. And there's a reason for that. In my second book, The Plot to Destroy Democracy, I have three chapters on how Russia uses information warfare. This is old KGB stuff. But it couldn't move fast enough in a time of printing presses and newspapers. Only computers and social media weaponized your freedom of speech. And your freedom of speech allowed them to carry out a, a technique that's known in the NATO Cyber Warfare Manual as perception management. And they craft your reality. Donald Trump's decision-making algorithm was created within the Russian sphere of influence. That's why when he came out and started talking about foreign policy, the first thing that he talks about is NATO is obsolete. And everybody looked around and said, where, where did that come from? Russia. The European Union should be dismantled. Russia. These are objectives of our adversaries, not of our nation. We have now had one-third of the American public's perception of reality is engineered by a foreign intelligence agency, weaponized through our own information systems, propagated through your friends and family, and now we don't believe what we've ever believed. We are so screwed. All right, you and can't, you, you can't, can't be here, you can't be in the pocket of the Russians and the Saudis at the same time. Yeah, you can't. You cannot you be can't. in the pocket of you. the Russians and the Saudis at the same time. Really quickly, how you can be, <laughs> because when you don't care how you win, you'll take assistance from anybody. And if that means well, treason, <laughs> so be it. If that means the Saudis come to you and promise you riches, so be it. If that means the Israelis come to you and say that we can engineer your social media, I've said this on television about 500 times since 2016. There are multiple dirty tricks teams that are being investigated by the special counsel. Not one, multiple ones. And so, yeah, you can do that. I've seen people commit, you've seen people who've committed treason for multiple reasons, not just one. But my point being, though, is that you, you can't have these countries that think that they're going to run his foreign policy through paying him off, especially something as diametrically opposed as the Saudi royal family in Russia. Russia, whose client state is Iran, and Iran, who is the mortal enemy of the Saudis. They're, these, the dumb person in the room, we've already kind of had the conversation about who that is, but the Saudis aren't idiots. Putin's not an idiot. The Israelis aren't idiots. But yes, they the might be able to throw... Idiot, com denominator right. here? Right. Donald Trump, and they know he's an idiot. Therefore, they can play him. I every have, spy okay. officer, every human intelligence officer can tell you, you recruit stupid people who are willing to look out for their own interests to betray their nation. So yes, they can work with all three. The old school geo, real politic people would have believed 
that your three ideological factors from these nations cannot compete with each other. But when it's money, it works. I have a question for you, yeah. um, Malcolm. I have actually both of you. Um, how did, how does the relatively small group of people spread across, advantageously spread across three states, how do they see Trump as a strong leader when he's a courtesan, if beholden to these bookies? Am I mixing up gender stuff? But anyway, and, um, and, you know, and a puppet and whatever else. I mean, it's, it, he's such a constant source of humiliation to the country and may, has made us obviously a laughing stock. And I just don't know, as we come up to the midterms, how he still represents like a Republican patriarch in any way. He doesn't. Uh, I mean, he That's, seems to be, he's so owned. He doesn't. I used to be a Republican. And he doesn't represent conservatism or republicanism. He represents Trumpism. Let's, leave, let's treat that as a rhetorical question for the moment because I want to I want to get Jack in the conversation here. Um, if you haven't seen uh, Jack's um, documentary, it's really terrific. I hope you will. He does. He has a terrific interview with um, Senator John McCain. It, it must be um, amazing for you to go back and look at that footage now. Mm -hmm. I would just like to ask you, Jack, since you put that film to bed. What do you think we have learned since then, since the debut of your film, and what do you think we still need to learn about Russia and interference in 2016 and 2018 and, and the relationship with Trump? Yeah, so I, I think that the, uh, since it's come out, the only thing that has come out since the film came out that I wish was kind of in it is uh, one of the things we did in the film, if you haven't seen it, is we go back uh, through other times Russia has intervened with elections in Europe. So we show how they did it in Ukraine, we show how they did it in Georgia, and they basically figured out their playbook and then applied it here. Uh, and so much of the film is, we, you know, the lock her up chance that came from Ukraine. Uh, they did that there. Paul Manafort ran that campaign. Uh, in Georgia, uh, for example, the Russian oligarch they got to run against the uh, pro-Western candidate would say, wouldn't it be nice if we had a good relationship with Russia? Things like that. Uh, and so in the Mueller indictment, there was sort of a, uh, a Seth Rich comparable thing in Ukraine uh, that I would have liked to have had. Uh, that uh, Yulia Tymoshenko, who was running there uh, against uh, Manafort and Putin's candidate, uh, Viktor Yanukovych, basically they accused her of a murder, having some person that was a small time person in the campaign murdered. Uh, so that would have been uh, a good thing. Where I think it's, uh, where I think it's yet to come out, uh, I think there's sort of, there are two camps of that. Uh, one, and I think a lot of this is gonna be done by journalism is, confirming things that we already kind of suspected or were already out there. I think that a lot of stories are going to be coming out in the next few weeks that really nail down stuff that has sort of been out there and that we sort of heard about. Uh, and then I think that there's another tranche of things that we have not heard yet. My, my understanding, and I wish I had more on this, is that there's actually a lot of stuff, names that have not been in the press, events that we have not heard about that are going to be included in what comes next. Uh, and then also I would watch the... Um, the other investigations, the Eastern District of New York, sorry, Eastern District of Virginia, Southern District of New York, mm -hmm. uh, and the New York AG. I think we're going to see a lot of really interesting stuff that isn't necessarily completely connected, but which is certainly not disconnected from the Russia collusion stuff, okay. or whatever you want to call it. Thanks. Vince, I want to ask you to, if you can help us put what we went through in 2016 in a broader context. Um, because what we've seen since then is really remarkable from Russia. We've seen the attempted assassination of a former Russian military officer in Salisbury, England, and his daughter. They end up being discovered on a park bench, unconscious, exposed to a Soviet um, toxin. And uh, we, we've seen more recently these indictments of the uh, efforts to target anti-doping agencies. Um, we have seen efforts to um, target other institutions that Russia and sort of Putin regards almost as sort of personal adversaries, right? In some ways, it's almost he's sort of these are personal enemies he's turning Russia's spy services and its cyber capabilities against. At the same time, it's it's almost comical how bad the trade craft has been. Mm. Yeah, rental cars full of equipment, right? Uh, with the you just they authorities just lift the uh, the trunk 
and, and expose this, this plot in Europe. Um, the, the crazy stories that these would-be assassins tried to tell about their trip to Salisbury to see a stupid church spire that they'd read about on Wikipedia. What's going on here? Yeah, the, the Russians have really redefined the concept of covert action. They've really eliminated that first part of the, the, the <laughs> phrase, right? Yeah. The idea was to present some kind of plausible deniability, like let's do something, let's overthrow Mohammed and Mosaddegh in Iran in 1953. Everyone kind of knows we did it, but you can't prove anything. And it, 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 a lot of former KGB people that we are associated with in the museum, they disown Putin. They say, because everyone's like, oh, he's former KGB, like not our KGB. Because the KGB in the 60s and 70s was a professional intelligence organization that when they did covert actions, you had no idea that they were doing covert actions until much, much later on, if at all. It goes back to an old Stalin phrase. Putin's more like Stalin than anybody else. And Stalin was always asked, how do you reconcile the fact that your equipment, your tanks, your soldiers are not as good as anybody else? And Stalin very famously said, look, quantity has a quality all its own. And he just threw men at the situation. That's what the Putin intelligence agencies are doing. The FSB, the SVR, the GRU are just throwing numbers at the rest of the world. And it's not like our counterintelligence has gotten so much better that we're catching everybody. It's that they're bumbling and stumbling. I mean, the, Rus the Operation Ghost Stories, which is the Russian 10, um, you might remember Anna Chapman in 2010, the Russian red-headed femme fatale that was arrested along with nine other Russian SVRs. Everyone's like, God, they're idiots. Well, they were. The FBI tracked them for a decade. Yeah. And before they finally rolled them up, because actually they were getting too close to the Hillary Clinton campaign, which is interesting. But they just did not take the time to spend five years at a KGB academy to get really, really good at doing espionage. No, they got about nine months and they sent them out. That's why we're catching all the bots, because the bots forget to turn off their location on their Twitter and they have like, you know, Kaepernick's a hero sent from Vladivostok, right? You're like, dude, <laughs> I mean, I like Colin too, but so there, it got to the point where it doesn't matter anymore because there's just so much, it's so, so much volume that you're going to get something through eventually. But also I would say it's yeah. more intimidating if it's brazen. Yep. They don't, I mean, I mean, Havel writes about this in the domestic context and the old Czechoslovakia and Kasparov and other dissidents talk about this. It is, it's more intimidating if, you know what, we don't care if you know, because we're doing it yep. and we're not going to get punished for it. And Putin hasn't paid much of a price for what he's done. And the Saudis will see if they pay a price for what they've done. Yep. And if they get away with it, that's more uh, uh, effective, you might almost say, than true covert operations, right. which you, you get what you did covertly, but you don't get the sort of ripple effect of the intimidation. So I, I think Putin, in a certain way, uh, as with Stalin, I mean, the show trials, they were ludicrous, right? No one believed these confessions, but precisely because they weren't believable, mm. they showed just how powerful Stalin was. Well, they, they, they weren't, they weren't we, stupid and clumsy enough to not work, for yeah. example. Well, <laughs> the, the Boris, shooting Boris yeah. Nemtsev, right. Nemtsev yeah. in front of the Kremlin. Yeah, right. Seems right. Like That's one a good one. Well, the all, anything. The Sergei yeah. Skripal thing changed the rules that had been established yeah. for about 100 years. He was traded. Right, so we, we captured the Russian 10 I just referred to and we traded them back to the Russians. Leon Panetta got on the phone, got, made this trade for three of our assets. Mm -hmm. And he was one of them. Now, in the history of intelligence, going back to when formalized intelligence started during the Renaissance, if you made a spy trade, they were off limits. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You were agreeing that they could live the rest of their natural life and we won't touch them. In five minutes of some not really bad tradecraft GRU poisoning. Right. He changed the rules that have been around for 400 years. Now they've already started changing things too. Diplomats are supposed to be off limits, but there's an exceptional video of an American diplomat in Moscow getting the shit kicked out of him right. as he's trying to drag himself inside the American embassy there. So there's just a Which, by the way happens almost to the day of the yep. Trump Tower meeting. Yep. Yeah. So it's just rewriting the way things are done. If I can make a point, you know, all of this is correct because Russia has adopted under Putin what, what I wrote in my book, I called the DGAF attitude. Don't give an F. We don't care. And so when I, when I saw that, when, you know, we analyzed that tradecraft. We talked about this at the Spy Museum at great length. Um, you have to ask yourself as an intelligence professional, why? What's the intervening factor here? What's the strategic play? And when I wrote about Russia's overarching strategy, it became very clear in the run-up to the 2016 election that starting in 2012, 
they had co-opted a very large part of the conservative movement. Evangelicals were running conferences in Russia. Uh, the alt-right was rising under Steve Bannon, which was, you know, uh, positioning themselves like the Russian Nashi, you know, their, their, their political stormtrooper youth and all of these things. And they, we literally have a fifth column in the United States that facilitated Trump's rise and Russia knows they all are loyal to Donald Trump and by extension to Russia. But it was always so, fringe. The people you've mentioned and, were always fringe and I think Bill hit Yeah, the but now they're the mainstream. That, well, they're yeah. speaking in other panels here. <laughs> so, this is not the mainstream, you know? Right. <laughs> no, but my, my point being this, you could not op run an operational mission like that if you knew you were going to get rolled up 100% of the time. But if you're transitioning that nation by recrafting their belief that Russia is an ally and that you're going to own the mindset of 30% of that population, you are eventually going to be running that population. You're giving them way too much credit. Russia's throwing- I'm only going by what they did. Yeah. Well, they're throwing, they're, they're throwing shit at the wall and something sticks and then when it does stick, they're ba it's basically they're probing. Sure. Right? And actually Jack's movie does a really good job of this, is showing the probes. <laughs> right? Uh, there you go. Yeah, I, I have a movie too. You Greg, know. Not just Malcolm's book. Uh, yeah, Greg's yeah, book Not too, just Malcolm's right? book. And then of course there's a great book over there too. <laughs> I have two coming out next week. We're on tour, we're out the date over the next few days. You want to check out our dates, we're on Twitter. What Rush is doing is probing, right? And that's what they've been doing for the last several years is they're throwing shit out there and see what sticks. And they're gonna, that's, but you know, we're both ex-military. It's what you do as a reconnaissance unit, right? You probe for the weak spots. And then when you find it, you send everything you got through it. And so that's what's happening. Even going back to the 2000 aughts is you see this probing. Where can we get traction? Where can we find people that are willing to kind of put aside what they believe for money or for influence or for power? It wasn't Trump at first, right? It was actually some of the far left side. Remember Jill Stein sitting at the, the lunch or the dinner award ceremony with Vladimir Putin. That's the my friend. Not the left. That's a little bit like left. No, that, she's um, green. No, she's no, the no, left. No, no, no. She's, left. she's yeah. green. She's really yeah. left. She, she, maybe she's so far left she's back right again, mm -hmm. but she's certainly left. So, but there, that's what, that, that's, I, that's where I have the problem with this broad Russia plan. Right? I think Russia, as bad as they are at a lot of these things, is trying to see what works for the last five or six years. And it turned out the Trump campaign worked. And so they went all in on that. Yeah, and uh, you've, you've read my books. And my point that I made is <laughs> there- I, ha I have to, he's on our board. Is, I gotta, <laughs> <laughs> you like that? Good movie here too. Yeah. There is a strategic, <laughs> my point is, there is a strategy on their part that is a decade old and they have carried out operations in full since 2012 and we're now seeing what we or you might call reconnaissance i'm seeing their activities are just being exposed but their mission is complete and we know it because they oh, their their operation supported the engineering and hijacking a mindset of one third of this nation and now we're in trouble we're going to get to questions from the audience in just a minute or two, but I, I want to ask Virginia one last question before we... The, the question I've hated the most, I think, on my little book tour of the past couple of weeks, which is, where does, what's going to happen next, right? Uh, um, what what do you, would you say uh, we have learned from Mueller, who has spoken exclusively through his indictments so far, mm -hmm. um, that can tell us anything about what happens next whether, including whether the Dems win the House? Well, if the Democrats win the House, I'm hoping, like a lot of people, that, he, that Schiff or whoever will let a thousand committees bloom <laughs> and <laughs> we will see invet probes into emoluments and everything that you think Jared Kushner's security clearances up to the Khashoggi uh, cover-up. Um, and everything you think that you vaguely remember, you know, that we haven't looked into, you know, I imagine this world where it's sort of, sort of heavenly paradise where you'll get some answers on some of those things. So that's maybe, I mean, that's, uh, 
well, I think we have reason to expect that we will have some of those committees. Mm -hmm. um, so, so that's the first thing. Um, and the other thing I, I get optimistic about is um, thinking about Robert Mueller and um, the other women and men in his office. They do not take conspiracy against the United States lightly mm -hmm. and crimes against the United States. And it is, I don't think, I don't think there's an unreasonable chance that Mueller and his team will petition the Department of Justice to lift the convention or the sort of statutes that say you can't indict a sitting president. Um, I may be alone in that, but I just cannot imagine, <laughs> you know, these guys who prosecuted the mafia, who prosecuted Enron, who prosecuted Al Qaeda, you know, who really went after some of the worst, the worst frauds, the worst criminal outfits, the worst crime sprees you can imagine, seeing the extent of this administration's corruption and saying, eh, we hope Congress does something with this report, but if they don't, we can't do any more. Greg, can I make one quick point on that? I know someone who knows... Is it about your book? I'm sorry, no. Do you have the page number lined up? It's in my next book. <laughs> I know someone who knows Robert Mueller for 10 years. And this, I, 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 I make this statement quite often because it's amusing. He says Robert Mueller has a hobby, by the way. He does something other than what you're seeing. His hobby is putting people in prison. Yep. <laughs> and I don't think he's going to pull. Like you said, Virginia, there will be no punches pulled on this one when you go take your sh when you go for the king you best not miss mm -hmm. and i don't think he's planning to miss all right, all right let's get to the audience <laughs> how how is this going to work we're just going to go back and forth why don't we start there if that microphone is working okay. well thanks for taking my question and actually this ties in um with what you were just speaking about so malcolm you're giving us hope for those of us who have been waiting and waiting in terms of the Mueller investigation a um, couple questions. One, I've been hearing at some prior panels as well, often on MSNBC, uh, just a lot of chatter that we think that his investigation is going to present something shortly after the investi I mean, after the elections. So I'm kind of wondering where that's coming from and how confident we are in that time frame. And again, kind of picking back, picking back on what you just said was, you know, the hope that there really will be some action, something um, for all the millions of us who obviously have been waiting and frustrated all this time, that they're really, um, I mean, I think we just have some anxiety right. that, you know, it will come out, so what, we'll just keep moving okay. on. So hopefully you can give us some there's hope a, in that. There's a political uh, dimension to that question. Correct, know, let's yeah. ask, let's, yeah. Bill, if you don't mind tackling that for starters. Well, just two quick points. I mean, I think... I think Robert Mueller is a very able man, and he has a few of the entire resources of the FBI and the Department of Justice, and as upon demand, the, our other intelligence agencies at your service, you can find out an awful lot, and an awful lot more even than, you know, um, competent uh, and very enterprising journalists or House or Senate committees. I, I am slightly dubious. Uh, I'm all for the committees investigating, and if the Democrats win the House, which I imagine they will, they, they should. But I would just say the history is that the disproportion of resources and knowledge and ability between Mueller and his team and much as I like, you know, Hill staffers working for Adam Schiff, or whatever, is very great. So Mueller is, in my view, the ball game. Look, I mean, I think this, I don't know what's going to happen. I don't know whether he'll decide if he can indict or not or whether he'll refer through Rosenstein to Congress. Um, if you had to bet just objectively, though, I don't know. I think Trump is probably going to have to be defeated ultimately at the ballot. But I do not believe, I guess if I had to bet right now, 50-50, put your money one in place or the other, I would not think he will be removed by, from office by impeachment and conviction or impeachment and forced resignation or conviction of a crime, which I suppose might not even remove him from office in a, in a, in a, a criminal trial um, in the next two years. So I still think, you know, ultimately it's, it's the, we're going to depend on the public to resolve this issue much as I, you know, Mueller may, of course, indict many more people, many more individuals. I imagine he will after November 6th. But um, I, I, but on the other hand, he could have much more than we, th I also very much agree with a couple of these comments. He, he could have much more than we realize. I mean, the degree to which he consists of, everyone I know who vaguely is associated, you know, a couple of lawyers that are very careful, that they work for various people involved in this, you know, who are tangential figures, really, in this investigation. They all say the same thing, though. They won't say much. They won't say it about their clients. But the one thing they say, and I'm sure you found this, Greg, and you found this too, I mean, that is Mueller knew so much more than we thought he knew. 
And I do think if there, to the degree there was a real conspiracy and to the degree all kinds of people were involved, up to perhaps and including the president, the current president, I think he will find out what happened. So I think we will find out the truth. That's the good news. I'm not sure the truth will set us free from Donald Trump in the next, in the next 24 months. That's the bad news. Over here. Yes, my question is uh, for Vince. Um, do you believe or do you think that perhaps in the latter years of the Bush years and then throughout the Obama years that we were potentially too soft on Russia and not firm enough in standing up to them that that allowed Putin to feel emboldened enough to do what he is doing? For instance, you know, with Georgia, we didn't do anything with Georgia. We didn't do anything with Crimea, and we didn't do anything with the annexation of eastern Ukraine. So do you think that that inaction gave him that boldness to do what he does? I, the answer is not very, you're not going to be very excited by the answer, is that we actually did a lot. Yeah. And we squeezed with sanctions to the point where he basically, Vladimir, the reason Vladimir Putin got involved in this election was he hated Hillary Clinton passionately. Mm -hmm. I mean, one thing that your wonderful film doesn't have is the Panama Papers. That, that is one Couldn't interesting... fit everything. I know, I know. It's, two, it's an hour and 50 minutes. <laughs> looking, you know, you don't want it to be too long. Putin got squeezed, and actually this starts at the end of the Bush administration, but certainly during the Obama administration. Yes, we don't go to war over Georgia. Sorry, guys. Right? It's not something we're going to... But the, the sanctions that were put on Putin's cronies, on the oligarchs there, were incredibly problematic for Putin, where his guys basically went to him and said... You're in power because we're letting you stay in power. I mean, Putin's actual hold on presidency is, is much more tentative than we think. If his <laughs> buddies don't like him anymore, they have enough power to have him have an accident or go away or do something. This is, or a coup. So once he was squeezed, and the reason that, like the Magnitsky sanctions and others, that is a way to really make Putin hurt. And that's what was happening, during the, especially at the end of the Obama administration and when Hillary Clinton was Secretary of State. He blames her for a lot yep. of things. Yeah. The Orange Revolution in Ukraine, he blames her for because she gives speeches in response to what happened there in Ukraine. Yep. And a lot of the stuff that was, um, a lot of the anti-Putin movement like Pussy Riot and other things inside of Russia were, were kind of focused more on the United States as being the boogeyman behind all of this. Can I, can I say, yeah. he took the traditional strengths of a president, which hurt them. It, hurt, it took their money, yeah. oligarch money, mm -hmm. and he decided we're going to be adaptive and we're going to be asymmetric and we're going to put a president in that will not be a traditional president and will remove all of those norms. And they did, and I think they've, they've won. I mean, it's a longer yeah. conversation, yeah. but I, I agree with you. I don't think we, I mean, for, we did some things, but we didn't do as much, nearly as much as we could have done in either Bush or Obama. And I think Putin took the lesson. He was happy to have to defeat Hillary Clinton and elect Donald Trump, who wouldn't be if you're Putin. Trump's much more pro-Putin, plus God knows what financial and other yeah. interests there were. But I think he felt generally emboldened by our fairly non-robust policy vis-a-vis -vis him. I'm in the middle of the two. I just want to say a word on behalf of sanctions and asset freezing, which was not a tool of the U.S. government before Magnitsky. It was just very hard to do. Um, uh, I was on a panel with Bill Browder, sort of exponent of the Magnitsky Act. Um, uh, or not, we were in a, doing a Q&A when the Skripal news came in. And Browder, who worked in Russia for a long time, is, you know, with very rich people. That's why he's so effective, because he's kind of almost one of them. He's a whistleblower. And um, he looked at the Skripal stuff really quickly and said, oh, all you need to do is freeze this apartment. I can think of what it is right near the Kremlin, lock everybody out of that, some glamorous apartment. And that drives them crazy. I mean, these guys are like, I don't know what they are. They're just like, prom. they want to be in a g gilded Bentley at the prom or whatever. Lock them out of Saint-Tropez in the south of France or whatever. Ah, they go crazy. I mean, these are not people with much gravitas. They're not like the ideologues of the Soviet Union who have ideals. They just want to take their mistresses as south of France in a gold Bentley, and if you don't do that, they cry in the corner. Well, Deripaska just lost all his money, yeah. and he's, you know, there's no Deripaska. I was asked by a senator just before the election, if you could do one thing with the U.S. intelligence community to punish them, what would it be? And I said, authorize NSA to seize their money worldwide. Just don't give a damn about the there. laws. Just freaking seize it. Well, it wouldn't yeah. be NSA. I mean, there's actually the, the, uh, most, un, yeah, the, most, unsung, <laughs> the most unsung intelligence agency of the 17 intelligence agencies yeah. is Treasury. a tiny little group within the Department of Treasury right. that does this 
targeted, yeah. grab them by the cojones and squeeze sanction yeah. war, where they did that a lot for terrorists too, like trace terrorist finance. But the minute that President Obama said, tell me who to sanction, Treasury was like, here, here you go. this is what yeah. makes it hurt. And those guys are amazingly good and they get very, no, they, purposely they get no. Well, uh, FinCEN has not entirely done its job, but now we're, we're, everyone's being held to account yeah. for their weird money laundering ways. So my, question, here. One hopes. so my question's about cybersecurity and the, and the future of uh, politics, elections, news media, et cetera. Is there an adult in the room anywhere in our country uh, that has any checks and balances? Um, is there an effective strategy in place that anybody know of? Way to keep cyberspace unattacked the way it's been. So th th this election wasn't, wasn't won or lost on cyber. I mean, Podesta had a, an IT guy tell him a miscommunication. He clicked on the wrong thing. And that's, it's not like they're better than we are. Right? The NSA is the greatest organization in the world by far doing cyber offense and defense. I'm speaking yeah. about, you know, it creating bots and I'm well, speaking about that, yeah, that. that. That's, yeah, that's, that's taking is, over voting machines. Right. I would you know, say, I, I mean, I just was in the a, tabulation. Yeah. Is, just, there any, the is there an adult a, in the room? Yeah, but, well, there are some, and I think the voting machines thing has actually been, is if now that we have paper ballots in most, um, about 40 or 50 states, uh, paper backup ballots at least, we're probably in okay shape on that. But I just talked to some people who work on this stuff who've just recently been in government, still in government. It's hard. The offense is ahead of the defense at this point. We could have the most adults in the room you want. And if you want to disrupt Sony, or if you want to disrupt our, our, our you know, election debate, or if you want to disrupt uh, steal stuff from financial companies, the defensive the, the offense is ahead of the defense. Now, we presumably have mutual assured destruction type capabilities where we can threaten them, but do you really want to get into that tit for tat? And, you know, that's where and we have more at stake than they do because we have, you know, like this huge financial system and what are we going to disrupt at Moscow at the end of the day or in North Korea or Iran? Right. So I think cyber is a huge problem going forward as an actual policy matter, even if we had people of good goodwill, you know, making the policies. The problem is a public-private partnership, right? You need Facebook, right. you need Twitter, you need those others to do something about it. And until they're going to, you can bot people to death. You can Facebook. I mean, Pizzagate started really as a kind of a Facebook thing. The Seth Rich thing was propagated because of Facebook and targeted Facebook. And that was less to do with the Russians. I mean, more to do with the fact that people aren't on Facebook aren't looking to take that stuff down. And I think that's really problematic. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Not to mention we're awfully susceptible to it as a society at this right. point. And I would just uh, yeah. put my tiny two cents in here with the, with the, um, to say that you know, I think that DHS and other agencies are, are working hard even on election security issues. It's hard to get a total sort of government effort when the president himself treats it as a hoax and dismisses yeah. it. So yeah. it does rob the, the, the ability of these institutions that can do more when uh, their efforts are discredited from the top. Over here. Um, there have been some really interesting discussions today just around the objectives of Russian quote unquote meddling, cyber warfare, high, you know, hybrid warfare, whatever you want to call it, um, you know, probing, um, getting the sanctions dropped, etc. But Army Asymmetric Warfare Group actually defines hybrid warfare as having the objective of regime change through non-kinetic means, as opposed to the old thing of rolling through the fold the gap with a, a million tanks. And so what I'm wondering is if that really is the goal, kind of like the senior chief was talking about as far as making America essentially not America anymore, then is conspiracy to defraud the United States really the right legal or other framework we should be following here? Not yes. sound bloodthirsty, yeah. but... <laughs> yeah, because we're not at war. Right. And, you know, as you say, this is asymmetric information operations designed to craft a new reality around your, the, the opponent's pop population. By the way, I'm quoting the NATO Information Warfare Manual right now. And the purpose of is that crafting book? that... It is. <laughs> as a matter of fact, chapter... Which eight. one? <laughs> Plot to destroy democracy. So the purpose of it, though, is to craft that reality in order to create a, a, a favorable operational environment for another nation to essentially run that nation by remote control. That has happened. 
mission accomplished. No, I don't agree with that. It's I not mean, no, no, no. 37 percent. You think the Russians are running this nation? Right, Come on. 37 percent of this nation right now does not believe a damn word we're saying. Well, you know what? And that didn't come from nowhere. Okay, they're not running this nation. A, B, I would just make this they're a very running. intelligent point. I mean, a question. There are two kinds of regime change. You want to put it this way. One is actually replacing one regime with another that you prefer. But the other is just causing chaos and weakening a regime that you think is hostile to your own interests. And I think it's much more the latter in the case of the Russians. I don't think they have some notion that we're going to have a Putin-like regime in the United States. I think they have the notion that they can cause a huge weakening and divisiveness and so forth within the United States. And they have done some of that. That, that I certainly right. agree with. And I think I, we got way ahead of ourselves. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we got about three minutes left. Let's do a really rapid fire last But real quick, question. the people that were most surprised about yeah. Trump winning were the Russians. Yeah. They, had, they didn't think, they thought we were going to have a very weak Hillary Clinton president. Yeah. So it's not like they thought they were going to win this thing. They, yeah. 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 Over here. Given the revelations about Maria Butina's attempts to infiltrate the NRA, uh, is, the, is the issue with Russian collusion more Donald Trump's unique vulnerability or a larger Russian attempt to infiltrate the conservative movement and conservative institutions? Yes and yes. Yeah, yeah. Donald yeah. Trump being recru is recruitable, and, and he is a, he, he's a dream for human intelligence officers. His vulnerabilities are literally written in the KGB operational recruitment manual of the type of person you want, a self-centered, narcissistic person who can be manipulated. And that being done, Maria Butina was just one of these other phases where they were going after NRA, they went after evangelicals, they went after the alt-right, they went after all these other factors to create people who would be susceptible to this re-engineering of the way their world is. There's a lot of self-centered narcissists on the left, too. But also, I think, I think it's, it's sort of a question of, like, was the problem with the plane crash that the warning light didn't go on or that it was a fire in the room? It's, it's a combination. The, the plane crash is a result. But what was the more pressing aspect of it? Well, they were all pressing. And I think that, that we, we really wouldn't, we wouldn't find ourselves in the situation we are as a country unless we had that amalgamation of things coming together to do that. Uh, so I think that they're both problems, but more importantly, they're both problems that fuel each other. Over here. Um, Jack, great documentary. Really, really fantastic. Um, everyone should see it. Uh, I just, a quick question for everybody, particularly Jack. Um, there are times when it looks like Trump is clearly in the pocket of the Kremlin. He has performance in Helsinki and his Twitter feed God help us. And then there's other times where, you know, today he withdrew. He said he was strong from the INF Treaty, which is going to piss off the Russians, launched cruise missiles at Syria, gave lethal aid to the Ukrainians. So in the documentary, it paints a, you lead us to an obvious conclusion, right, that he's compromised in some sense. Malcolm, I know I have followed your stuff, same thing. To each of you, to what extent do you actually believe this man is compromised by the Kremlin? And in, did you actually believe he is taking or has taken some sort of um, you know, instruction from them, and I'm, I'm yeah. you know, so to what extent? Uh, to, to a fairly large extent. I mean, I, I think that when we talk about puppet, we tend to think of it in the abstract, and we don't really get into what that means. I mean, you know, when Napoleon's Bonaparte's brother was running Italy, or was running Spain, rather, he did a lot of stuff that he didn't like. There was constant back and forths. Are we going to argue he wasn't a puppet? No, he was a puppet. That doesn't mean, I mean, Yanukovych did things that Putin didn't want. So when, when I think of somebody being compromised or there being... Um, uh, something like that, I think that there's, a, there's two things. One is, how are they compared to the other potential candidate? And I think in this case, it's obvious. Uh, and the other is, not can I completely control this person? Does Donald Trump wake up waiting for his orders from Vladimir Putin about what he's going to have for breakfast? No. But is there a lane that he has to stay in? Is there things that he has to avoid? Or at the very least, does he have to negotiate around those things in a way that he's not considering what's best for America, he's considering what's best for him uh, and I think that that is clearly, I mean, to me, uh, clearly an issue and a problem. But I do think that, and you make a good point, I think it's counterproductive for us to think of it as being, you know, like a robot-operated puppet. It's very human. It's very uh, all about personality. Uh, and so it's complicated. But, it's, but I think that there certainly is compromise. Um, but yeah. yeah. Do we have time for one more? Let's do this. This has to be the last one. I'm really sorry, but go ahead. Thank you. Um, so from a cybersecurity perspective, right, we have probably the best intelligence agencies in the world that we have ever seen, right? We have data collection methods through notes on the internet lines and everything along those lines, right? To me, it's a systematic failure from all of these agencies to allow all of these things to happen. And then how do we rein 
Or how do we grant our independence back from a subversion tactic that has basically worked? I worked at the National Security Agency, and I can tell you right now, uh, they are the commensurate organization. They are the best organization in this world. But they work within laws, okay? And those laws are generally done, are generally issued through leadership and orders by a person who is running the intelligence community according to our national interest. Russia uses cyber warfare like we drink coffee in the morning. They really have a DGAF attitude because they have a, an objective that they want to meet that requires introducing chaos, introducing mayhem, weaponizing all these old KGB information warfare techniques at the speed of the electron. And they know democracy cannot keep up. Autocracy can, all right? Those guys can use it as they see fit. I mean, how long did it take us to stop, you know, the, the, the concentration camps in World War II and the mass murder? You have to go through a war to stop that. They understand we're not going to do that. So long as they're not shutting off powers on power plants, which kills people, they know that we will have a discussion and a debate about it, and whatever their objective is, they're going to get away with it. And they can't do that, so that's fine. Um, they can't, right. But this is not an intelligence agency question. It's a political question. I mean, Malcolm's dead on about that. This is, this is the willingness of Congress or the, the White House to act. In many cases, we're very good at being reactive, closing the barn door. I mean, you look at after 9-11, after reacting to certain things that, you know, coming later on, we're reacting to these things also. Being proactive is incredibly difficult. The, go the government's not designed, the Senate's not designed to be proactive about a lot of things. So the NSA is going to do what you tell them to. The NSA has capabilities long, far beyond what they're allowed to do. Yeah. I mean, Michael Hayden, love him or That's hate him, wrote a spectacular book called Playing to the Edge, where he talked about the government of the United States, the Constitution, Congress, limits what the intelligence agencies can do, and it's their job to play all the way up to that edge line. If you want to spread out the field some, and take the gloves off, which actually the conversation has been lately about doing offensive cyber. And sometimes the best defense is a good offense or whatever you want to say. But we've done things like Stuxnet in the past, which have changed the way cyber is done. We're still the only country in the world to have a cyber attack that had physical damage to it. Which but, I, the don't you th but it's also more complicated. In this, I mean, the NSA does not run Google, Facebook, yeah. et cetera. They don't run the banks. They don't run the electric companies. And this is where it's not like previous national security challenges. In the 50s, our nuclear posture, many smart people decided it was very dangerous, it invited to just, you know, first strike uh, uh, adventurism and stuff. So they were, the government controlled all the nuclear weapons. The government decided, okay, we have to put weapons on submarines, we have to have second strike capability, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. They basically fixed a problem. It's not so easy to do that in cyber. You got, you got to get your tech companies in, you got to get your financial companies in, you got to change the, I mean, so cyber is a weird situation in the sense that the, and I'm, this isn't a bad thing, I don't think we want the government controlling all these things, but the private sector is, but vulnerabilities in the private sector are vulnerabilities for the country as a whole. Yeah. We saw that with Facebook. So you can say, well, the government should do something about it, but it's not quite obvious exactly how the government orders Facebook to do A, B, or C. Thank you, panel. Great job. Thanks, Greg. It's out your book enough, guys. <laughs>